you guys missed it. So the band, uh, <laughs> the band later is going to do a song called Good, Good Father, which you've heard before. And I was upstairs in my office, and uh, they, they just were having fun, and they remixed it into, the only way I could put it is an emo Good Charlotte version of it. <laughs> and it was just CJ in here with the band going, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It was really good. So... Uh, the band is going to go back to the back and dye their hair black and uh, put some mascara on and return. And no, anyway. Uh, you know what we're really, really good at? We are really, really good at, at monitoring and modifying our behavior, aren't we? I mean, think about it for a minute. We all do this. When you, when you enter into a new job, when you go to church for the first time, when you go back to church, when you meet your girlfriend's in-laws, you know, your, or your girlfriend's parents or your future in-laws, you walk in and you're very, very careful about what you say and what you do. Right, Jimmy? Right, Jimmy? Right, Jimmy? Right, Jimmy? <laughs> you're very, very careful, you know, because you don't know these people yet. You know, you don't know. You don't know what's funny to them. You don't know what's, what's cool with them. You don't know what they do. And so you're, you put some filters on, Right? You put some filters on. You know, I remember when I met my wife uh, or her parents, I didn't have as many tattoos, but I made sure to cover them up just in case tattoos were an issue, you know. You'd be very, very careful about, you know, what you talk about and stuff. We all do that. We monitor and we modify our behavior. But here's the thing. Every once in a while, every once in a while, something slips out. Something happens. We say a word, we do a thing, or sometimes it's not even words, sometimes it's emotions, right? And all of a sudden it comes out, and people, you can immediately see it on their eyes. They're like, whoa. And what do we say? We say things like, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know where that came from. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, that, that, I just want you, that is not me. I'm so, so, so sorry. And, and the, the other person's looking at us going, oh, I know where it came from, it came from your mouth. This is exactly where it came from. And that may not be who you are, but that is now burned into my mind. I will always remember this little outburst that I just saw. Like, wow, geez, whoo, I didn't know that was in him. And we go, no, 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 that wasn't me. I want you to understand that's not me. That's not who I am. I'm so, so sorry. I don't know where that came from. But here's the question. Where did that come from? Where did it come from? What happened? And what happened is all of a sudden those filters that so many of us put on, it failed us. What happened was, is as many filters as we may, ha may have had on, our emotions got brought to a level that it just popped through there. And for a second, for a moment, who we truly are came out. Who we truly are popped out and somebody heard it, somebody saw it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is where that stuff comes from. And how do we stop that stuff from happening? Because the answer is to not put better filters on. The answer isn't to put more filters on. The answer is much, much deeper than that. And so if you haven't been with us the last five weeks, we've been in a series called Guardrails. And we all know what guardrails are, but just as a refresher, it's a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limit areas. And usually found at bridges, medians, and curves. And the thing about guardrails is they're always placed in the safety zone, not in the danger zone. There's always this gap. There's always this room. And this is going to be very, very important for our conversation today. Because it's never before the damage can be, or never after the damage can be done. It's always placed before any damage could ever be done. It's there so that you can see it from a mile away, even when you're in the safety zone, even when you're in your lane. It's very, very obvious, and it's there so that no damage can be done. But it's also there to minimize the damage, so that if you do hit it, the damage is minimal compared to if you did go off the road and go into some water. It's there in case you did go off the road and into somebody else's lane of traffic. It's very, very minimal to hit a guardrail than what could potentially happen. And the reason we're talking about this is because we all need some personal guardrails. And a personal guardrail, what it becomes is a standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. It's about wisdom. We're not talking about right and wrong. When you look at the scriptures, it doesn't say do the right thing. It says do the wise thing. And the wise thing is determined by your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams. What may be wise for me may not be wise for you, and vice versa. But this is a conversation about personal guardrails. And we've talked about in this series, you can get caught up at any point in time on, on YouTube or on Spotify or on Apple pod, uh, Podcasts. But we talked about guardrails with friends and relationships. 
We talked about guardrails with our sexual integrity. Last week, we talked about uh, financial guardrails. We all need guardrails so, so that inside our conscience, if we start to go out of our lane, something dings us and goes, hey, you're about, to, you're about to run into something. You're about to go into the danger zone. You're getting very dangerously close to having an accident. And so you need to correct, pull back into your lane. And today, like I said during my prayer, we're going to talk about the most important guardrail you could possibly have. We're going to talk about a guardrail around your heart. And if you don't know anything about the heart, when we talk about the heart here in church, it's, it's a metaphor. We're not talking about the literal heart. We're talking, about, we're talking about who you truly are, your inner self, your soul, the epicenter of who you are and the place where your emotions and your thoughts come from that eventually lead and create behaviors and actions. But Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and that's just not a Bible thing, that's a world thing. He, he, he ran the kingdom of Israel for a very, very long time after his father, David, and it was probably the best kingdom ever. And he was considered to be one of the wisest rulers ever. We have historical documents that tell us that people from all around the world would come to visit Solomon just to ask him questions, just to receive a piece of his wisdom. But what scripture does tell us is that the way he received that wisdom was God asked him, Solomon, what do you want? And he asked for wisdom. He said, God, give me wisdom so I can better serve your people. And he said, that's a terrific answer. And that is exactly what I'll give you. So he was considered one of the wisest people that ever lived. And he wrote uh, books that we have in our Bible. He wrote the book of Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. And he writes about all of these different things. He talks about friendship. He talks about being a leader. He talks about family. He talks about relationships. All this different stuff. And so... There's one certain thing that he talks about in a proverb where he says, look, if there's anything I could warn you of, if there's anything that you should put a guardrail around, let me tell you what this is. And he says this in this proverb. He says, above all else, above all else, guard your heart. Your heart is the most important thing that you need to have a guard rail around, which may, be, may seem a bit hard because you're like, well, what is this metaphorical thing that I can't see? How do I, how do I place a guardrail around my heart? And he talks about why this is so important. He goes, here's why this is important. Because everything, everything you do flows from it. Every action, everything you do flows from your heart. So here's the thing. If this is true, okay, and you may not believe this is true, but just, you know, play with me for a minute. If this is true, if it's true that everything that we do outwardly starts with this inner part of ourselves, then it's probably important to pay attention to what's going on inside of us. What's going on in our mind? What's going on in our emotions? What if possibly our emotions and our thoughts are the beginning of us starting to slip out of our lane and into oncoming traffic. If that's true, then we should better pay attention to this tension that Solomon is trying to talk about. Now, a thousand years later, here comes Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, the man who claims to be God in human form walking on this earth, and guess what he talks about as well? The heart. And so here we are, we, we, we catch up with Jesus Matthew's there, so he's writing all of this down eventually, and he's, he's giving us this story. And everywhere Jesus went at this point in time, it's Jesus, his 12 disciples, and then a crowd of people, and then all these religious leaders. And all these religious leaders are constantly just trying to trip Jesus up at this point. They're trying to catch him and doing something wrong or saying something wrong so that they can arrest him, so they can kill him. And so they're surrounded, and this is what happens. Matthew writes it down. These religious leaders come to Jesus and they say, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Which if you're reading this with naked eyes and you don't need to know any context of this, you're going, ooh, yeah, that's disgusting. I'm kind of with the religious leaders. Like, yeah, why don't the disciples wash their hands? That's a very, very good question, right? But here's the thing. You have to understand the context of this. This thing of washing the hands, this was a tradition of the elders. The elders and the religious leaders, they continually had to have their hands washed. That was a rule that they had had. And they always had to have their hands washed so that they were pure because they didn't want to touch anything unholy. So they always had to have their hands washed. Well, eventually what they had done, and I'll explain this in a little bit, is they had made that a rule for everybody. Hey, always keep your hands clean. Everyone's hands have to be pure. You don't want to defile you, you know, yourself by touching something dirty. So always keep your hands clean. 
So they asked Jesus this question because they're in breach of this law, which was known as part of the tradition of elders or the oral law. Okay? And so Jesus, he throws this back at him. He goes, all right, you guys want to spit? Let's spit. So Jesus says this. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And again, you probably read that. I, I read that with naked eyes, and I go, I, I have no clue what we're even battling about now, okay? So, like, what are we talking about? But everybody who, let me just create some context. Everybody in the crowd would have been going, oh, dis, okay? So this is like a, this is like a, old Jesus rap battle that's going on, okay? So just like have that kind of in your, in your mind, okay? So what in the world is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about this tradition was this oral law, this tradition of the elders. You all know about the Ten Commandments, right? Right? Moses comes down with these tablets, these, these laws that are written down, and here they are, and they had 613 written down laws that were from God. They were, very, they were obvious. They were there in front of everybody. They were clear as day. Everybody knows what the Ten Commandments are, right? I mean, you could probably name a bunch of them if we had a pop quiz. Don't worry. We're not. But here they were, right? Well, along the way, over hundreds and hundreds of years, the religious leaders just started making up laws and tacking them on. And they were called the oral law or the oral Torah because they were never written down. They were just spoken. And it was so complicated and skewed, we don't even have any historical context for this. They're not in the Bible. They're not written down anywhere. That they even started to debate with each other about what was true because everything was just made up. And it was getting to the point where things were made up and they were actually breaching the actual written law the actual law of Moses, and it just got very complicated, very, very skewed. So Jesus throws it back at him and goes, well, let me tell you, why, let me ask you this. Why are you guys breaking God's law to fulfill these made-up traditions that you guys have? And then he says this. He says, you know, for God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. And then he says, but, but we know this, but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their mother or father is devoted to God. They are not to honor their father or mother with it. Now, again, naked eyes, this makes no sense. I'm completely lost, Pastor. Let me tell you what this was about, okay? So one of the oral traditions, okay, these traditions that were passed down, is one thing that you could do is you could just, you could just orally say, everything I own belongs to the temple, Okay? You, didn't even have to, you didn't have to go write it down. You didn't even have to go tell the temple. You just had to say it. Everything I own belongs to the temple, which stated or meant that everything that you owned belonged to the temple, that you were giving all of your riches, all of your finances to the temple. But it actually didn't go to the temple. It was just a made-up thing. You were spending your money however you wanted. You were just stating that it was the temple's. But here's what it allowed to happen. Then, if all of a sudden my mother-in-law comes to me, her name's June, by the way, if my mother-in-law comes to me and says, Michael, you know, I, I need money, I need help, I, I have grown old, which she is, she's getting very, very old, and she's, I need help and stuff, my hearing aids are failing me, you know, and stuff, Can, you know, I need some financial assistance. What I could do is I could go, oh, Junith, I love you so you are my favorite mother-in-law of all the mother-in-laws I have. But here's the deal. I ain't got it. <laughs> because you know what? I just claimed, I yelled in my backyard last week, everything I own belongs to the temple. And it's not mine. It's God's because I'm such a good Jew. And so now everything I own is the temple's. It's actually not mine to give. And so I'm sorry, I cannot honor thy father or thy mother-in-law because I ain't actually got it. So be gone with you, all right? That's what I could do. And that's what they were doing. They were using this as a way to say, well, like legally, I'm a good follower of God, but also I ain't got to do nothing for you. So ha ha, this works out for me. And so Jesus knew that this scam was going on. Everybody knew that this scam was going on. And so Jesus throws this in their face. And he goes, man, that's awful. And this is what he says to him. He says, thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Which this was the biggest diss Jesus could give these people. This was a big forget you is what it was. All right, You hypocrites. And then he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Boom, mic drop, everybody goes, oh, 
whoa, and Jesus just walks off, all right? So that's the end of it, all right? That's the end of it. And so these guys are embarrassed. Jesus just called them hypocrites. He just said, forget you, and then he walks off, and then the crowd starts to follow Jesus, and Jesus is kind of hot. Okay? Jesus is a little hot now because he hates this stuff and he doesn't like this stuff going on, taking advantage of people, finding ways around the word of God. And the thing is, is you got to remember, Jesus was this hinge point, right? He had come to fulfill the law of Moses and that was going to pass away. That was the old. It's the reason we call it the Old Testament because it's the old and busted. The New Testament, it's the upgraded iPhone, okay? It's the new. And Jesus was a hinge point. He was coming to fulfill the old because it had become obsolete. It had served his purpose. It was there to get us to Jesus. And so Jesus was coming to replace it. And so every once in a while, he dropped these little breadcrumbs as a clue about this new he was about to bring. And so he pulls all the crowd together. He goes, everybody, come here and listen to me. And he says this to them. He says, Jesus called the crowd together and said, listen and understand. I'm going to start using that. Listen and understand, okay? Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. Because you may or may not know this, but remember, the law of Moses, there were so many dietary restrictions, okay? It was all about being pure. It was all about having clean hands. And part of that were dietary restrictions, certain things you couldn't eat. And they believed that if, man, if they ate a pig, they were dirty, right? And that word defile, that word defile means unclean. That means you were in opposition with God. You were an opposing force of God. You just put yourself at odds with God. And he goes, I want to make it very, very clear, okay? I know what the law of God says, but let me tell you something. What you eat does not put you at odds with God. And then he says this. He says, but what comes out of your mouth, that is what defiles you. Or that is what puts you at odds with God. And again, Jesus walks off. And everybody is very confused. Because they're like, what did he just say? Like, I have grown up my entire life that, like, we could not have pizza rolls on Wednesday. Because, like, that was a thing. And he just said that that's not true. He said, forget that. Okay, that blows my mind because I never, like, that, okay. But anyway, but then, like, what comes out of my mouth? Like, what? Like, we're talking about, like, gas or something? Like, what are we talking about? Like, what, do, what comes out of my mouth? So everybody's very, very accused. So Peter, you know, Peter was always the one to, like, you know, step up because he always wanted to be Jesus' pet. You know what I mean? So he's always brown-nosing Jesus. So, so Peter walks up to Jesus and he goes, hey, Jesus, uh, if you got just a second, uh, I understood everything you were saying. Uh, very clear. Uh, love that. Yep, things out of the mouth. Um, but I don't think they all understand. You know, they're, uh, they're not catching up. So just like, could you, like, explain it to me like I'm a child. You know, like, um, just, you know, you know, throw that at me again, the whole thing coming out of the mouth. You know, and just, you know, explain that to me. And Jesus looks at him, and he goes, are you so dull? Which, if you don't read your Bible very often, uh, if I could translate this into 2023, uh, are you stupid, is what Jesus is saying um, to Peter. He goes, are you so dull? I'm going to start using this on my kids. I didn't call you stupid. I called you dull. Uh, are you so dull, is what Jesus says. And then Jesus, Jesus says this, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Which, again, Peter's just a fisherman, man. I mean, if any of, if any of you were having this conversation with Jesus, you'd be like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the body, out the body, yeah, oh, yeah, mm, I'm with you, Jesus, I'm with you. And Jesus is going, okay, all right, I got to break this down for you. And he says this. He says, look, the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. This is what defiles people. Then it started to make sense. Okay, so what you're saying is, it's not about dietary restrictions. It's not about what we eat. It's about what, it's about the words we say. It's about our actions. It's about what comes out of the mouth. That, that is what puts us at odds with God. But why, why would that put us at odds with God? Because the things that come out of the mouth and our actions, those don't affect God. Those only affect people. And Jesus is going, exactly. And then Jesus just makes it clear as day. He does explain it like he's a, he's a kindergarten. He says, look, because out of the mouth comes evil thoughts. Out of, the, out of the heart comes murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, 
false testimony, slander. He could have gone on and on. And Matthew was like, this is all I remember. I mean, Jesus had a list of things he said that this all leads to. I couldn't even keep up. I can only remember like nine of them. But Jesus starts saying all these things, that things out of the heart, what they lead to, behaviors, actions. And everybody's listening going, but those are only sins against other people. And Jesus goes, exactly. And that is what defiles you. Here's the thing we have to understand. This is, this is even maybe new for you, depending on what your church background was like. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in, right? But the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was all about me and God. It was, a, it was this relationship, right? It was an up and down relationship. I just need to keep God happy, okay? And so they were throwing up sacrifices to God. And even today, depending on your religious background or how you grew up in church, you might have been told something very, very similar, that this relationship between you and God, it's just a, this relationship. It's just a vertical relationship. And you need to go to confession, and you need to go to church, and you need to pray, and you need to do this. And it's just you to God, you to God. Throw up the right things to God. Do the right things to God. And Jesus comes and he goes, look, I'm done with that. That is old. That has been fulfilled. What it would be said later is that it was obsolete. And I'm telling you, it is not this vertical relationship. It is a horizontal relationship. And what defiles you is not what's going on here. What defiles you or puts you at odds with God is what is going on between you and the people next to you. A way to put it is this. What puts you at odds with God is when you offend or harm one of the father's children. That's what defiles you. That's what puts you at odds with God. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Because I'll be very honest with you, okay? This is a little glimpse into who Michael Davis is, all right? There is not much you can do to me that will, I'll, I'll forgive you, okay? You really can't hurt my feeling is that bad, okay? I will always, you know, I'll never throw away a relationship or anything like that. I will always fight for our friendship, always fight for our relationship and all that stuff. And I have very, very thick skin. There's nothing that I really haven't heard in the life that I've lived. But here's the deal. If you hurt or embarrassed or offend my children or my wife, can't look out, right? <laughs> I mean, now you've just crossed a line, okay? And here's the thing. I might be cool with you, but if you have hurt or offended or embarrassed Braden, Olivia, or Kate, you, you, you're dead to me, all right? I mean, that's just the thing, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, because here's the thing. If I got to choose a side, I'm always going to choose my wife's side. I'm always going to choose my kid's side, you know? Because, I mean, they're my kids. They're my family. They're my wife. I am going home with them after this, okay? I mean, I am with them. And here's the thing you have to understand. Everybody, all people are God's children, Everybody's God's children. I know you're like, I'm a child of God. So is everybody else in the room. So is everybody else across the street. So is everybody else a block that way. So is everybody else at the other church. I got news for you. Everybody's a child of God, and God cares and loves all of his children equally. So you know what that means? God don't care if they're a Democrat. God loves them. God don't care if they're a Republican. God loves them. God don't care if they're woke, they're broke, they're white, they're black, they're gay, they're straight. God loves all the little children of the world, okay? And so here's the thing. If you do something to offend, embarrass, or harm one of his children, you just put yourself at odds with God. And any parent in the room will understand this. Look, I know my kids do stupid things sometimes. My kids are dull. Let's use a scripture word, okay? My kids can get dull, all right? And you can look at my kid and be like, dude, your kid had it coming. But you all know this as a parent. I know my kid's stupid sometimes. I don't care. I love them anyway. I'm still going to have their back. And here's the thing. You might look at a Democrat or Republican or this person or that person, but, but they had it coming. They're so stupid. And God goes, I don't care. They're still my children. And I love them anyway. And you went after them. You, with your words, with your actions, out of your heart came something that defiled them. And so now you've just put yourself at odds with me. And Jesus says this. These things are what defile a person. But eating one with unwashed hands, that is not one of them. So here's, here's the thing. Let's put this all together, okay? 
if what harms people offends God and what harms people comes from our heart, we need to guard our heart. Right? Because the words and the actions, they begin as emotions and thoughts. And I know we're very good at putting filters on. But here's the thing you have to realize, and we've all experienced this at one time or another in our life. Our behavior will eventually mirror our heart. Your behavior will always catch up with your heart. So... There are four emotions, four internal monsters of the heart that I want to bring to light and I want to talk about real quick. Because these are things that sometimes we feel, sometimes we don't feel them, sometimes we see them. And if we feel them or we see them, we need to identify them and we need to deal with them. And the four, there's a great book by Andy Stanley, called, it used to be called Monsters of the Heart. I think if you Amazoned it, it'd be uh, a, a Enemies of the heart is what it's called now. Great book. You should read it. I love it. This is where all this comes from. But if you see or feel these certain things, you have bumped up against a guardrail and you need to deal with them. And the four emotions are this. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. And in each one of these relationships or emotions, there is a debt-debtor relationship. Somebody owes somebody else. And I, I want to explain this to you. This is what they are. So there's guilt, right? Guilt says, I owe you. Guilt is what I feel when I have done something to harm you. You may not even know about it, but I have wronged you. I have taken something from you. I have betrayed you. And so whether you know about it or not, through my actions, through my words, I have gossiped about you, I have hurt you, I have betrayed your trust, I have given in to something I shouldn't. And so now what I feel is I feel like I owe you an explanation, I feel like I owe you an apology, and that comes as guilt, right? And we've all seen guilt. You can see guilt on people's faces. I have a terrible guilty face. My parents could always tell when I've done something wrong because the guilt bled through. The guilt was on my face. And my mom was like, what'd you do? Nothing, mama, I swear. <laughs> she knew it. She could see it on my face. But here's the thing. Guilt, man, guilt eats you up inside. And so many times when we're feeling guilt, it lays dormant in the dark. A secret will suck the life out of you. And there is, there's those times where somebody, they're looking at you. This happens a lot in marriages. They're like, hey, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Are you okay? I'm fine. Are you okay? I'm fine. But the truth is, is you're not fine. What's happening is, is the guilt inside of you because you've done something wrong, because you have a secret to hide. It is bleeding through and it is affecting your relationships with others. Then there's anger. Anger says, you owe me. Anger is you've taken something from me. You did something to me. This is when you're the victim. You did something to me. You took something from me. And you owe me something. You, you, owe, you owe me back. You owe me an apology. You owe me. But here's the thing about anger. Rarely do we ever get what we want from the person who owes us something. But the thing about anger is this. Anger is never isolated to the relationship of origin. Here's what I mean by that. When you are angry in your heart, it might have been your ex-wife, your ex-husband, that old boyfriend, that old girlfriend, maybe your parents, may have been your last boss, your last pastor, your last whomever. Whatever they did, they feel, you feel like they took something from you. But if you don't get what's owed to you, what happens is you carry it over into your next relationship. And as soon as somebody else reminds you of that person who took something from you, you start to hold hostages. They remind you of that person who took something from you. And so you start to hold hostages. And in every single relationship you enter into after that point, you start to hold that debt that somebody else owed you over somebody else's head. And you are holding hostages until you get what you deserve, till you get what you want, till you get your justice that you're looking for. That's what anger does. Anger also bleeds into our other relationships because it never stays isolated to the relationship of origin. And then greed. Greed, which we talked about a lot last week, so I'm not going to talk about that a lot. But greed is, I owe me. 
Greed is the assumption that everything is for my consumption. It's all mine. It's my money. It's my hard work. It's my stuff. And I, you know, I, I know this people need stuff. I know the church is looking for backpacks. I know that, you know, this person, you know, is going through something and they got to go fund me for this. And I know that person on the highway, they're doing this or whatever, whatever it may be. And it's like what we do is we go, well, I mean, I would love to help you, but, you know, it's, it, it's my money. And I worked hard for it. And it's mine. And it's all here for my consumption. So here's the thing. I'll give you some prayers. I'll pray for you. My heart goes out to you. Isn't that just, it's so weird when we say that. My heart goes out to you. Okay, well, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but my heart goes out to you. But greed is the assumption that it's all for my consumption. And then jealousy. The monster of jealousy. And jealousy is the ugliest one there is. Because guilt, eventually we can admit, I'm feeling a little guilty. Anger, I mean, like, are you angry? Yeah, I'm angry. I'm ticked off. That's an easy one, right? Because you're the victim. Greed, eh, you know, but jealousy. If you ever looked at somebody and said, are you jealous? No, right? Absolutely not. I'm not jealous. But we do. And jealousy is life owes me. Jealousy is why do they get to have a wife, a husband, and kids, and I don't. I don't why, why did they meet somebody and I didn't? Why did they get the promotion and I didn't? How come they're able to find a job and able to do all these things and able to have all these things in life and, and I didn't? How are they able to be that skinny and I'm not? How are they able to do these things? It's just, it's, it's life owes me. And here's the thing about jealousy. Jealousy becomes gossip. Jealousy becomes slander. Jealousy becomes anger because somebody else has what I don't. Something that I want. But here's the thing about jealousy, because we don't think about it in these terms. If, if people's success or opportunity triggers you, you have a problem of the heart. Okay? If people's success or opportunity triggers you, you have a problem of the heart. The heart. So take all these four emotions, these things, these feelings. Here's the thing. When you see it, when you feel it, you need to address it. So I want to give you some guardrails to put around these four emotions. Because these emotions, these emotions should be the guardrail. Okay? Because before there's a behavior, you go to somebody's behavior. You go, you look, pull back anything you've done or somebody else has done. And you go, where did that come from? Where did those words come from? Where did that outburst come from? It started way back here with an emotion. And when we bump into, when we start to feel or see these feelings and these emotions, that is the guardrail that needs to bump us back into our lane and know, I am going in un. Un, uncharted territory and I'm at the brink of there's one chance where I might get so emotional all my filters will, will fail me and I will go off and I will do things and I will say things that I will never be able to take back and I will reveal what is truly in my heart so there are four things we need to do to combat each one of these enemies of the heart or each one of these monsters of the heart and so let's go through these with guilt with guilt the feeling that I did something wrong to somebody else, we need to confess. Now, this again might be new to you, depending on your church background, depending on how you grew up. But when I say confess, I am not talking about confessing to God, okay? That is completely pointless, okay? You really think you need to go to God and be like, hey, God, uh, just wanted to tell you, I did something really bad. I'm feeling really guilty for it. And so anyway, and God's up there going, well, wait, What? You did what? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't have any clue. I'm sorry. I was asleep. Let me get my journal out. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody should have woke me up when you did that. Okay, so what did you do? Okay, uh-huh. And how many times? Good Lord, boy. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we can deal with that. All right, keep going on. You think that's what God is in heaven doing? You think you need to confess it to God? Again, I know some of you grew up. I'm not going to say the name, okay, because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to trigger anybody, okay. I don't want anybody to get angry. But here's the thing. Some of you grew up in religious settings where they told you to go to a, a magic closet with a magic window that you could only halfway see through and tell you you needed to tell the magic person, and the magic person would say the magic words that would give you the magical forgiveness in your heart that would take your name off the magical book that's in heaven and that you'd be okay, all right? That's, a, that's pointless, okay? 
That's not even scriptural, all right? You go through the scriptures and look at the word confess. Do you know what Jesus says we should do when we need to confess? He says you need to go to the person that you've done wrong. And let's be real honest for a second. The reason we want to say the magical prayer or we want to go to the magical booth and tell the magical person that we can't look in the eyes is because it's easier than going to the person we wronged, right? But Jesus says, if you've done something wrong, if you're at the altar and you realize your brother has something against you, you better leave that altar, you better leave that temple, you better leave that holy place, and you better go find the person you did wrong, and you better confess and work it out with them. Here's the thing. If you've done something wrong to somebody, you need to go confess it to them. And yeah, it's going to be chaotic. I've literally had people come to me and be like, I did something wrong. I am feeling so much guilt. It's keeping me up at night. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I literally feel sick. And I need to get this weight off my shoulder. I've prayed to God so many times for God to take it away. And I don't know what's wrong. I'm going, because God ain't going to take it away. Because God can't take it away. Because it's your burden. It's your guilt. And it will never be lifted off your chest until you go to the person you've wronged and you confess it to them. And you work it out. Here's the thing. Although it will cause chaos in your life, it will be embarrassing, it will be hard, you have to. But once you do, there will be an inner peace. There will be a pressure valve that will release that will give you so much of an inner peace that you'll be like, I'm so glad to get that out. I'm so glad I don't have to hide that anymore. Because it's secrets. It's secrets that suck the life out of you. Then, anger. Anger says you owe me. But the thing with anger is to forgive. Now, nobody likes to do this, right? Because that's canceling a debt. That's saying you don't owe me. But here's the thing about forgiveness. I hate the saying, forgive and forget. Because that's stupid. Because nobody does that, right? You can't forget some of the stuff that's happened to you. But I'm not telling you to forgive and forget. I don't think there's some things that will happen to you that you will never forget. Forgiveness is not about, uh, not about forgetting. Forgiveness is not even about the person you're forgiving. Forgiveness is a decision for yourself in your heart to move on. Forgiveness is a decision to move on. And to not hold what one person did to you, to not hold it over the head of other future relationships, to not hold it over the next person you date, or the next person you marry, or the next pastor you meet, or the next church that you go to. The decision to forgive is not about the person you're forgiving. It's the decision to let yourself free out of the jail that you have decided to put yourself in. Forgiveness is about moving on and canceling the debt and living your life free. Yes, you will never forget it. And you can work that out through counseling and through time and it will become better. But for the, ang- the motion of anger, it will eat into your other relationships and it will destroy any amount of happiness that you could possibly have available to you in the future. And then greed. And greed, the answer is to give. And again, we talked about this last week. We talked about that we need to reprioritize our life to to give, to save, and then to live. The number one way to not be a greedy person is to give away on a regular basis to help other people. But then this last one, jealousy. Jealousy. Which I wrote down here, life owes me. But let's be really, really honest At a certain point, at a spiritual level, what you really know and say in your heart is God owes me, right? God owes me. And this is a very emotional one. This is a hard one. Why did God take that person out of my life? Why did God not give me what he gave them? I did everything right. I did everything the way I was told to do. And God still didn't give me the same breaks as he gave them. God took people out of my life that I wasn't ready for them to leave. God stole something from me. God twisted this up. And I don't get that and I don't like that. And that, I really hate that. And here's the thing I want you to understand. Because I know a lot of us in this room, we've suffered loss. We've suffered heartbreak. We've had things happen to us in our life and in our childhood that I could never understand and I could never know how you truly feel. But what I want you to understand about how God works is a lot of us, we feel and we've been told that God is up in heaven 
shuffling the deck, handing out cards to a certain one of us. He's even looking underneath and going, yep, I'll give that one to that person. But that's not how it is. What's happening in life is that life just throws us random cards, man. Life just happens and throws us random cards. And here's the thing. The people who aren't jealous, the people who aren't angry at God, the people who have found peace in their life and are able to go through difficult circumstances, what they've done is they've taken all the cards that life has thrown at them and they've looked at them and they've said, well, that's a crappy hand. And then they've gone, all right, God, what can you do with this? It's not that God is dishing out the cards. It's that life is throwing things because we live in a broken world and a broken society and crap happens. And so they get thrown a crappy deck of cards and they look at them and they go, all right, God, this is a bad hand. What can you do with this? What can you do with this? And that is when on the other side they're able to see peace and victory and success. Because they hand it over to the hands of God. And I've watched Christians find that. Some of the most resilient, most strongest people I've ever met in my life. People I looked up to. People I admire. They are not people who have had perfect lives. They've ha- they're people who have been dealt a crappy hand. But they have been able to find peace. And they've been able to find success. Because they've handed it over to God and said, God, what can you do with this? But the people who are, not, who are able to not let jealousy eat them away inside are the people who have made a decision to celebrate other people. To look at what other people have, to look at their success or their fortune or their opportunities and say, wow, congratulations. I'm happy for you. Good for you. What a blessing. To celebrate other people is what we're called to do. So here's the thing. These emotions, guilt, anger, greed, jealousy, these things that are going on in your heart, when you start to feel them, when you see them, you've got to address them. Because what could potentially happen is if you don't respond to that guardrail, if you just keep powering through it and you plow through that guardrail and you just keep trucking into that danger zone, you are putting yourself in a dangerous position to not only hurt yourself, but to hurt other people. And when you hurt other people, you're hurting God's children. And when you put yourself at odds with people, that's when you put yourself at odds with God. Now, this is really important to me. You know, I I was talking about the decision to go to two services, right? We made this decision. And this was not an easy decision. I mean, we've debated this for a long time. We talked about it. Staff talked about it. Leadership team talked about it. And one of the things that got brought up was, you know, my my dad, my my family's planted several churches. My dad planted a church in O'Fallon 24 years ago. And several of us are OG members of that church, too. And so, you know, it was brought up, you know, hey, there was a time, you know, we did this at New Life. We went from one service to two services, and it didn't work out. And we pulled back, and we came back to one service, you know. And so we don't want that to happen, and we don't want to, you know, lose any momentum or anything like that. And during that time, I was in, I was in college with Darren and, and Kate and Shane and several people here. And, you know, I, I wasn't there for all of that. So I called my dad this week. And I said, hey, Dad, like, this got brought up with leadership team. And it's trying to remember, like, what went wrong? You know, like, let me, let me learn from your mistakes. And, you know, what, what went wrong? Why did you have to go? You, you went from two services, and you had to come back to one. What happened? And he reminded me what happened. And what had happened was is that our worship leader, who had been with us, this was about the 10, 11-year mark at New Life, about the same time we'd been around. And our worship leader, who had been with us from the very beginning, had multiple affairs on his wife. And he said, well, remember, so-and-so had an affair. And I went, oh, that's right. Because I remember things were running and gunning, and, man, new life was, man. New life, new life was a special place. And it, it seemed like we were all genuinely in love and following Jesus in a community and a family together, and that none of us would do anything to ever hurt each other. And I remember I was in college, and my dad called me in tears, and I thought somebody had died. And he said, this is just what happened. And I remember I came back in town, and there was a big 
meeting and stuff, and my dad was trying to protect this person and not tell details that anybody else did need to know, and there was just all this stuff going on. And I remember one woman specifically who had, was newer to our church, just a couple years new into being a Christian. I remember she looked at me and she said, I just didn't think things like this happened at this church. I thought this church was different. And she left. And so through all that, people left, and certain people, just because of the way it was handled, I mean, it was handled the best way it possibly could be. Some people thought it could have been handled differently. And my dad, he told me, he said, you know, he said, he said I feel like it was at that point people just started to trust me a little less. He said, I, vent, he said, I think that's what eventually led to me leaving three to four years later, is I just threw that thing. It was so hurtful. It was so f- painful, and I just lost so much credibility and trust with people because there's just some people think I should have done it a different way. It just, it just made the whole thing fall apart, Michael. And so I say that to say to you, you may, this may be your first time at our church. You may be new to our church, whatever it may be. But I told our Wright City campus this on Wednesday night, too. I believe God is doing something special through our church family. I don't know where this growth we've seen came from. This is not a program. This was not a plan. This was not anything else. I have always been under the assumption that summer was the dry spell of churches. And typically, we just come and we pray anybody's there. That's typically what we do in the church world. We're like, please, God, in July, I hope there are people there. And not everybody is at the lake this Sunday. Like, that's what we do. We usually hold down the fort and then fall is, you know, when things start to happen. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And I'm truly blessed. Because I know it's not on my effort. It's a God thing. It's just God saying, I trust you. I trust your leadership. I trust your staff. I trust you all. And these people are ready because they're looking for something. And so I will send them to you. But I say all that to say that one of the things that can derail the entire train is if just one of us, and it could be any of us in this room, could be me, could be any of the people leading worship here, could be somebody greeting at the door, could be somebody in our kids department, it could just be you out here. The thing that could derail it all is if we don't guard our hearts, and out of that anger or that greed or that guilt or that jealousy, or whatever that monster of the heart may be, if it becomes something else and it hurts the other people in this room, if it hurts the families in this room, if it hurts the children in that back room, then it all can fall apart. Then that's when it becomes broken. That's when we end up having to retreat and gather our forces back together. And I have lived through that And I never want to live through that again. Which is why I make the personal decision to guard my heart the way that I guard my heart. And I've had several people come up to me, you know, you're going to have to preach twice. You're going to have to do these things. Are you going to be okay? And I'm looking at people, and I'll be very honest. I haven't said this out loud to anybody, but I'll tell you this right now. You don't need to worry about me. You need to worry about you. Don't worry about me. I'm taken care of. I got my stuff together. I'm doing what I need to do. I'm more worried about you. I'm more worried about our leadership team. I'm more worried about our staff. I'm more worried about the people sitting in the seats or the people watching online or the people at our Wright City campus. Because the number one thing the enemy likes to do is when God is rolling and the kingdom of God is coming to earth, is he likes to come in and stir the pot and he always starts with our hearts. He's like, I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to make people begin to not trust each other. I'm going to cause dissension. I'm going to turn brother against brother, sister against sister, and I'm going to stir up their hearts, and I'm going to make them jealous, and I'm going to make them angry, and I'm going to make them greedy, and I'm going to make them feel guilty, and I'm going to do some stuff. And I don't want to see that happen. And here's the thing. I can't guard your heart for you. And enough prayers ain't going to guard your heart. And enough scripture ain't going to pray, ain't going to guard your heart. And enough worship ain't going to guard your heart. You've got to do the work. So here's the thing you've got to do. You've got to get your personal mirror out and look yourself in the mirror and ask God, God, what is the condition of my heart? Do you see any places in me 
that are beginning to look like this. And then you need to deal with them. You need to confess. You need to forgive. You need to give. And you need to celebrate to get yourself back in your lane. And if you will do that, and as scripture says, if you will understand what the Lord's will is for your life, you will put yourself in a position to not only make your life better, to make, but to make you better at life. And you will put yourself in a position where you will have a clear understanding of how to love God, how to love people, and how to love yourself. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God. God, this message has been a real burden because I've seen what a bad heart can do. God, I know that when we don't take care of our emotions, when we don't take care of our baggage, when we don't care of our, take care of our thoughts that we're having, I've seen how it fleshes out. I've seen how the guardrail can break. And I've seen how it can hurt other people. I've seen how it can affect a child. I've seen how it can affect a marriage. I've seen how it can impact a community. How it can impact a church. So God, before any damage is done, will you help us right now to take a good look at our hearts? Would you examine us from the inside out? Get underneath the filters that we turn on. Look in the secret places and the dark places that only you can see and, at, and help us to examine ourselves, and then help us be transformed from the inside out. Help us to break these four monsters of the heart that can wreak havoc in our lives, God. And change us and renew us and continue to do what you're doing, God. The journey, the faith journey that you're taking so many of us on, God, Help us to continue on the path that you're taking us. Help us to continue to grow in love and in mercy and in peace. Help us to continue to learn how to better understand your will and to better understand how to love God, how to love people, and how to better love ourselves. God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, the band's going to come back, and we're going to worship for just a little bit longer together.